Welcome to Order Military Radio TV, and we're lifelong Catholics, and what we do is all for free, and for our love of Jesus Christ, and for our Holy Mother, the Church, and we'll defend our Holy Mother, the Church. That opening is so true for today's shows, and however long it takes us to do the shows, thanks to David Yellow. Uh, this sh- this, sh- this sh- first show on the sex abuse crisis. Um, don't let any uh, kid hear it. Those we could face. Uh, don't don't watch it, but we're going to be exposing a lot today, and we welcome Brother Lexus to the show. Thank you, AJ, for having me on Order Militaris Radio TV, where we talk about lots of problems in the church because we love the church, not because we're trying to drive people out or scandalize them. You know, if there's corruption in your town, you're safer if someone tells you that there is. And the reaction isn't to get up and leave town. The action is to get the police to elect, elect, arrest the crooks. And the church has a lot of the methods to solve problems anywhere from writing a denunciation to your bishop, to having a council kick people out of the church, define doctrine or establish new laws. And um, sexual abuse of minors by adults has been going on for thousands of years. This isn't a new human phenomenon. And um, as recent studies have shown, it takes place where um, the adults have a dominant position, the children have no voice, and they're in social environments where they're secluded or isolated and can immediately appeal to people outside the control network. So this happens in all kinds of institutions and in all kinds of religions because uh, Adam and Eve bit the apple and fell and their progeny became cor- morally corrupt. So in the Catholic Church, a particular kind of sexual abuse is more prevalent in the Roman Rite because our clergy are uh, celibate and they're supposed to be men who have nothing to do with sex. Although in reality, because of the lack of proper filtering of candidates, a lot of individuals infiltrate the priesthood and religious life, both men and women, not because they want to live as virgins for the sake of the kingdom of God and the love of Jesus Christ and for the salvation of souls, but because they want to hide their perversion and be in a situation where they have such power over minors, they can prey on them uh, with impunity, uh, using the habit of religion as the mask. This is a horrible affair that's been going on. Uh, when John Paul II opened up the secret files of the Vatican shortly after the year 2000, scholars finally learned why St. Anthony of Padua became a Franciscan and left his monastery in Spain, in uh, Portugal, because the uh, abbot there, who was, I think, a cousin or, or nephew of the king of Portugal, had had been had was reduced to the lay state something like eight times for raping boys in the monastery and uh, had recently been restored and St. Anthony being um, a rather attractive young man said he's going to he decided he's going to get out of that monastery before he's the next victim. So these things on back then and um, it's not they probably will always go on no matter what kind of laws you have. Unless you had absolutely omniscient uh, saints in all formation programs immediately who could see someone's soul and say he's a pervert and know his future him from ever becoming a priest or or a brother or or a nun, which is obviously not how God designed the world. So um, what we're going to talk about today is uh, about this despicable crime, and uh, we're going to stick to the not allegations but actual known cases. And we're quoting from Yallop's ninth chapter of entitled Beyond Belief in his book The Power and the Glory. And AJ will give you the page numbers in what edition you're reading from, AJ? Yeah, so mine is, uh, I just found it for you. So first, Carol and Graf edition, 2007. And I'll be reading from the poetic 
Products Limited Edition 2007. And mine has 750 odd pages, 200 pages more than AJ's, but it's the same text because he has more words than a page. And this could be a bit confusing to anyone if you don't know what edition or re, uh, we're going to be reading from. So try to give you both page numbers so you can follow this law. And uh, we're not going to do much editorializing. This is going to be a more recitation of it. But um, this is really, I love the title of this chapter, Beyond Belief, because it's beyond believable that an institution which is called to represent such holiness and such heavenly views should have criminal networks involved in such disgusting and uh, perverse uh, exploitation of the most innocent and weak individuals. So um, where, do, where, where do you want to begin, AJ? Yeah, for me, it's on page 270. And me, it's 376. The Roman Catholic Church looked after its own the offending clerics could not be brought before civil courts unless special permission was obtained to do so. The system was one that clearly had the full approval of Pope John Paul II. In 1983, after 24 years' deliberation, the current code of canon law was published among many changes from the previous 1917 code. Law 119 covering the need for special permission was removed. It was a decision that many of the Catholic hierarchy have since bitterly regretted. In less than two years, the floodgates had been opened. Within a decade, the cost of sexual abuse to the Catholic Church at every level was devastating. In the United States alone, since 1984, the financial cost and legal fees and awards to sexual abuse in the excess of $1 billion. The cost to the image and reputation of the Catholic hierarchy is inestimable. It is very like, okay. yeah. Uh, I just want to point out now. So the Catholic clergy have judged their own members for more than a thousand years. This is a tradition even found in other religions in pagan Rome. The priests were only tried by priests. And it's an ancient principle that like is tried by like. And um, in the Catholic Church, since Christ has all authority in heaven and earth, the, the clergy have always considered themselves to have the sole right, divine right, to judge their own. Now, this is a good principle, theologically speaking, uh, for saints, if saints are running the system. But once someone is criminally insane, gets in a position of power, this, does, this principle doesn't work. It ends up producing the opposite. Go ahead, AJ. It is very unlikely that the Pope was unaware of the scale of the problem at his election and the traditional response to the secret system. Up until 1981, he had ignored every request for help from the victims of clerical abuse to himself and to various Vatican congregations. The origin of the secret system, like the crimes it kept hidden, go back as a very long way in history. Prior to 1869, when the description of homosexual was first coined by Carl Maria Binkirk, the term used to describe sexual acts between two or more of the same gender was sodomy. Sodomy was used to describe not only sexual acts between adult males, but also intercourse with animals and, and sexual abuse of a child or youth. This later act was also frequently described as pederasty. The term uh, pe pedophile was first used by the physiologist Havelock Ellis in 1906. The current scientific usage defines the sexual abuser of a prepubescent as a pe pe pedophile and the sexual abuser of an adolescent as a Epibophile. Okay, so he's incorrect in his explanation here slightly. In the Catholic Church, sodomy is defined as an attempted sexual union in a way that cannot produce life. So an act of sodomy can commit, be committed by two men, two women, or a man and a woman. 
uh, can be committed by man and woman. When the man puts himself inside the woman and the one in the other two places that can't conceive life. I won't be any more explicit than that in case some children are watching. So that's sodomy. Um, uh, some authors will say that masturbation is a form of sodomy because it's putting the sexual organ where it shouldn't be. OK, so uh, that's the question that the correction there. So I wanted to comment the removal of Canon 119 in the code of 1917, which required special permission before these people could be brought to civil court, was a good thing. And John Paul II should be praised for this, although the code had already been in preparation for many years and canonists were in agreement that this was the way to solve the problem. So he may have not realized what would result from removing that, but it was a good thing. So it is a good thing that these crimes and these networks have begun exposed. This is a good thing. That means there's going to be less victims. And uh, if you ever have uh, the sadness to speak to a victim and see how absolutely tortured they are for the rest of their lives by the math, by the fact that they were sexually abused or assaulted by a nun or brother or a priest, uh, you can see it's a wonderful thing that these things are exposed and that's why we're exposing it. Okay, the next one is on page 273. Now I'll point out that in the Catholic Church, these priests will always be punished. You can go back to 177, it's even Yallop quotes. I think Niagara says that these kind of angels should be uh, characterized as forms of adulterers and excommunicated and, and kicked out of the church. So we're talking about corruption in modern centuries where the code of canon law didn't contain that. So you remember before 1917, there was no code of canon law. So the ancient canons could be observed if there was the will to do so. But once the new code was published under uh, Pius XI, the same guy who gave Nagara Bernardino Nagara the Vatican money. Then things went. All right, I actually said it was Benedict the fifteenth, but um, so the secret system that protects the clerical sex abuser was functioning effectively and as far back, at least as the early part of the seventeenth century, when the founder of the PR store, Father Joseph. Caliphants suppressed the sexual abuse of children by his priests from becoming public knowledge. One such pedophile, Father Stefano Cherubini, the member of the well-connected Vatican family, was so successful at covering up his crimes, he even succeeded in becoming head of the order. It took 15 years of complaints against him and the other senior members of the order before action was taken by Pope Innocent X. The order was temporarily closed down. As historian Karen Diebrich in Fallen Order shows, the 17th century secret system had a very modern ring, including promotion for avoidance, elevate the abuser away from his victims. Okay, so this is a true case. But and but Saint Joseph Calasans didn't hide the thing, and that was the general advice of the age, that you don't publicize people's private sins, even if it was you, you wouldn't announce in the streets a man uh, the fact that a man committed adultery against his wife, even if you knew of the thing outside of the confessional. It wasn't done. It's not considered. Uh, the thing it was is there's no conception that of the that this sin, pederasty, or the sexual abuse of minors, was actually a form of criminality. Now, here we have to distinguish between crime and sin, and this is something moderns don't understand because in the modern state, we only have crimes, we don't have sins. Uh, tomorrow, Obama could go to a house of male prostitution that's legalized in Nevada, and he would commit no crime, and they don't think that's a sin, okay? But a crime in, 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 church, in church legislation has to be a violation of a law, and there's no law against it. Some people may not want to call it a crime, even though it is a crime against the divine law. So uh, in recent centuries, the, the, the degradation in Catholic theology, leading people to think of laws as things written by men and not by God, has led to a lot of non-observance of the divine law, and this is where 
this vice starts spreading all over the place. Joseph Califasanz is still a saint. He probably overlooked the fact. He wanted to get the guy out of the way, and he did send him to Rome. And the guy did become head of the order, this Seraphina Kirabini, and the order was suppressed. That's historic fact. Um, maybe some pope one day will take away Father Joseph Califasanz's honors at the altar, not because he's not a saint in heaven, but because as an example to the faithful, uh, that kind of cavalier uh, handling of such a case isn't something that we should raise to the level of the all to be admired anymore. Until the 1980s, John Paul II and many of his cardinals and bishops, including Cardinal Ratzinger, chose to ignore centuries of sexual abuse by priests. There's undeniably a direct unbroken line which stretches back over the centuries from the present scandals a pedophile priest back to the first millennium. Wherever one looks in the present, therefore, there are powerful echoes of the dim past. Recently, yet another secret Vatican document concerning the crimes of solicitation has surfaced. The document instructions on the manner of proceeding in cases of solicitation deals with the crime of priests attempting to procure sexual favors from the individual whose confession he is hearing. It was published by the Prefect of the Holy Office, Cardinal Alfredo Ottaviani, with the approval of the then Pope John XXIII in March 1962. The document has never been made available to the general public. The distribution list was confined to patriarchs, archbishops, bishops, and other diocesan ordinaries. Among those receiving a copy would have been the newly promoted Bishop of Krakow, Carol Tivo. Okay, so uh, we can't say that uh, John Paul II or Cardinal Ratzinger or anyone who's a bishop, even people who've who worked in diocesan administration as of after 1962 didn't know what these things were because there was a document that we each sent a document. Now, Vatican is constantly sending documents to the bishops of the of the world that are not for publication because you know criminals could find how to get around the law if they knew what the law was and so or they knew the procedure for proceeding in the in the case but uh, this document is particularly um rancid to modern sensibilities because it has so many levels of secrecy it to, to, are to be maintained now, one reason for this is that there are a lot of false accusations against priests for committing sins of this kind. And if, as in the civil state, as soon as someone was accused, it hit the nightly news program, how would that priest ever exercise a ministry again if he was falsely accused? Okay, And false accusations are not a rare thing. There's several priests in a father in Bray in New Hampshire, uh, falsely accused by unknown false accuser. Only one person accused him, this, uh, uh, I think, a drug addict and with a criminal record. And there was a case in Detroit where a priest was falsely accused by his bishop and, uh, and I think uh, the Archbishop of Detroit and uh, uh, some of the high members of the diocese. And he was acquitted not only in civil court, but also in canon law court. And, and uh, he won both cases. And he also won a civil damages case. So, um, there are reasons to argue in favor of a certain amount of secrecy and accusations of this kind. Uh, clinical experience of psychologists, and those who counsel the abused, has inclined us in modern times, in just recent decades, to incline rather to the opposite position because if they abuse one child, they're probably a serial abuser. And it's best that we find out, put their name out there so that other victims come forward. And this has led to a huge increase in the number of reports. Now, it might be that there were high, lots of cases of this going on in all levels of society for from the dawn of time. Uh, but only in the Catholic Church do we actually have a, a legal system to handle these cases. You don't hear about these things in the Boy Scouts and stuff like that. So um, you could fault the church, and a lot of people say, oh, your church must be full of homos. But if we didn't have a legal system, you wouldn't know about this. If we didn't actually have laws and procedures, uh, it would never come to light. 
So John Paul II, as much as you might want to criticize him for many things, by approving the new code, which removed Canon 191, he actually made it possible for a more modern approach to this. And this isn't a change of doctrine. This is understanding the criminal mind. And um, the gospel doesn't teach us how to understand the criminal mind. It teaches us how to get to heaven. So don't expect priests to know how to handle criminals, even in, uh, when they're brushing shoulders with them in the rectory. In 1984, the first clergy malpractice lawsuit in the United States by an adult woman was instigated by a Los Angeles lawyer on behalf of Rita Miller. More than two decades of stunning revelations of sexual abuse were, un, un, were, were ushered in by one of the for, forgotten victims. Like so many victims, Rita Miller was the first abused by her priest while taking her confession, Father Santiago Tamayo reached through the flimsy screen within the confessional can, and uh, and uh, touched her on the, on the chest. She was 16 and planning to become a nun. Over the next two years, he systematically set about seducing Rita. On that first occasion, he told her in the confessional that he had a secret and as she leaned forward, he opened the screen and kissed her. By the time she was 18 in 1979, after being repeatedly advised by the priest that God wants you to do all you can to keep us priests happy, it is your duty. Rita and her confessor were, were um, shacking up. Father Santiago then began to put pressure on the young woman to make his fellow priests at St. Philomena Church in Los Angeles also happy too. Eventually, Rita was making uh, seven priests so-called happy. None of them took any precautions. In 1980, she became pregnant. Then Father Tomeo persuaded her to go to the Philippines to hide her pregnancy. Her parents remained unaware who were told she was going abroad to study medicine. The group of priests gave her $450 to last seven months and told her to leave the baby in Manila. Rita was critically ill during childbirth and nearly died of eclampsia. Convulsions occurred at the end of the pregnancy as a result of blood poisoning. Her family discovered the truth and brought Rita, brought both Rita and her baby daughter back to Los Angeles. This happened after Bishop Abaya in the Philippines had undertaken to give her financial assistance and not merely to cover her travel expenses, but toward the, un the upkeep in the education of the baby. When that aid failed to materialize, Rita went to Bishop Ward in her California diocese, who also was unable to help. It was only then that Rita and her mother filed the landmark clergy malpractice suit. They sought to establish paternity, sue the priest in the church for civil conspiracy for breach of fiduciary a duty, fraud, deceit, and to protect other young women from the pain and suffering caused by priests who abused their position of trust. The case was dismissed by the courts who cited one year statutory time limitation when Attorney Gloria Allred called a press conference in 1984 to draw attention to the case. It transpired that all seven priests had vanished. Far from following the pre precise steps ordered by the Vatican in such cases, the Los Angeles Archdiocese had ordered all of them to leave the country and to stay abroad until further notice. It would be 1991 before the role of the Archdiocese was made public by a guilt-stricken and remorseful Father Tomeo. Letters also confirmed that the Archdiocese had regularly sent money not to Rita, but to her abusers hiding in the Philippines. In August 2003, Rita's baby, now 20-year-old Jacqueline, 
Mila finally learned that her father was Valentin Twega, one of the seven priests. This was confirmed by a court ordered paternity test. Tomeo and the man who had manipulated the 16 year old Rita publicly apologized to her in 1991, admitted his role in the affair. Nonetheless, the only financial compensation that Rita has ever received was a $20,000 trust fund set up by the Los Angeles Church in 1998 for her daughter, and this was done only after Rita had finally agreed to drop a slander action against the bishop. Okay, so here's just one case of how bad it can get. Now, <clears throat> a yallop is tasteful by going into this one deep case because he chose the case of a girl being abused and which there was a pregnancy. And um, it should not surprise anyone that priests can have children. After all, they are men. But the way the archdiocese handled it was like a, a criminal mafia. And this is because to this day, in the Code of Canon Law, crimes of this sort are not punished by immediate exclusion from the priesthood, which uh, for the seven priests, they should immediately be dismissed from the priesthood, never allowed to practice again, and maybe they have been. But for Father Tamayo to have manipulated this girl who had a vocation to be a nun consecrated to God, he should be burnt alive for his malpractice, he should be burnt alive because he did something worse than the devil. I mean, the devils must have been an admiration of this guy. That's how evil it was. And I don't care about you saying you're sorry, Father. You committed a crime not only against that girl, against the priesthood. You deserve to burn on both things, even if you're repentant. Repentant, then, you know, God will take care of you. You won't go to hell. But you need to burn for something like this. Because this is a total abuse of the confessional a total abuse of religion and a total abuse of readers trust in the priesthood of Christ. Not to mention it's a sacrilege against the divine name. So um, uh, did the system work? No, the system didn't work. This was under the new code and they still weren't following. But Los Angeles Diocese is notoriously corrupt and worse things than this can happen, you, you imagine. Uh, it, at least it didn't sound like reader was being sexually tortured or sodomized, um, but um, and I don't think you can fault a young girl who's told by priests that such and such is and is not a sin to end up in such an affair. Obviously, she didn't have a well-formed conscience when she went to this priest, and uh, she should have sought a second opinion. But a lot of children go to confession and don't know they're being manipulated. That's why, um, though. The priest cannot reveal what is said in confessional. Parents should ask their children what advice the priest gave them, and especially if there's any doubt about a priest. You know, if you have a priest who dresses lewdly, uh, has profane art in the church, doesn't preach against the sixth and uh, the sins of the sixth and ninth commandment that are against the sixth and ninth commandment you're risking your children by allowing them to confess to a priest like that. Bring them to a holy priest that they'll never see again in a distant monastery and have them go to confession there so that if they are solicited, they can't go back because it's like 40 miles away and they don't have a car. And that's always been the practice of good families. In my family, we never went to confession in our parish. Never, ever, even though the Fourth Lateran Council says you should go to confession in your parish, it was never done because this is the reason why. Now, um, um, the poor Rita, uh, and uh, sh should she get more financial uh, compensation than that? I think she should. But the, and the Diocese of Los Angeles is super wealthy. But the fact that they told the people to go overseas and go out of the country, they should be charged with criminal conspiracy. That's that's racketeering. That's what that is. So until 1985, that was how, how the secret system worked. In many countries, including Italy, Spain, Germany, and Poland, still functions. The case that Rita Miller had attempted to bring went nowhere. It would take a great deal more than that to shake the system. 
and it was not long in surfacing. In January 1985 in Boise, Idaho, Father Mel Baltazar was sentenced to seven years imprisonment after pleading guilty to reduced charge of lewd behavior with a minor. Also, our plea bargaining was a shrewd move as diocesan records show a history of continuous sexual abuse by, uh, by the priest over 20 years be period. The victims invariably young boys. He abused a critically ill boy on a kidney dialysis machine in a hospital in California. He abused another young boy in double leg traction in a medical center in Boise. Baltazar had previously been dismissed from his post as chaplain in the U.S. Navy for homosexual behavior. Subsequently, he had been transferred from three dioceses for sexual abuse of behavior. His superiors with full knowledge of his record took no action when confronted by distraught parents other than to transfer him to a new diocese. Among those unimpressed with the Catholic Church's approach to the problem was the trial judge, Alan Schwartzman. When passing sentence, he paused to stare unblinkingly at the priest standing before him, then, then observed, <clears throat> I think the church has its own atonement to, to make as well. They help create you and hopefully will help rehabilitate you. Well, this guy should this guy should have gasoline poured poured on him, tied to a wooden stake, and allowed to be burned slowly to death. And uh, is you have to be a total psychopath to have be a priest and engage in this kind of behavior. Uh, if you were not a priest engaged in this behavior, you're totally criminal and insane already. But to do it as a priest is a thousand times more evil, and it should be punished that way. And if there were punishments like that. These guys wouldn't join the priesthood, but um, um, a man like this who did these things in the Navy shouldn't have been taken into the priesthood. And um, although a lot of vocations, good sound vocations come from the military, it's always to be highly suspected if a candidate for the priesthood was formerly an institution that was all male. It's, it's highly suspect. Because it's almost like he wants to be in an institution with all men. And that's not normal for a man. A man wants to be near beautiful girls and and, and uh, things of that kind. Now, of course, if the guy's a womanizer, he shouldn't be a priest either. But it's not infrequent that vocations who were in the military don't turn out to be uh, good apples. And then we're going to be talking about Next, Father Gilbert and Gassi. Um, who at the time of his initial exposure in June 1983, was a parish priest in the parish of Henry in Vermilion, Louisiana. The revelation began with a pathetic simplicity. A distressed nine-year-old boy confessed to his mother that God did not love him because he had done bad things. The child slowly and painfully elaborated and talked of the secrets that he and Father Gazi shared. The first was the mother, first his mother, then his father listened as the boy began to reveal some shocking truths. The priests have been abusing, sexually abusing him for at least two years. Gazi had also been abusing his two elder brothers. If the story was all told, it would be estimate that Father Gothi had molested more than 100 boys in four parishes, some of them many hundreds of times. Learning the truth as far back as early in 1970s, the church had responded in the usual manner. They moved him to another parish. An early report on Gothi described his problem as a case of misguided, misguided affection. Okay, so um, this and John Paul II participated in this. There's no recent revelations that came out this year showing that John Paul II used, moved abusers around the diocese when he was Archbishop of Krakow. And uh, Cardinal Law, when he resigned from Boston, 
kind of precipitously was Archbishop of Boston in the United States. It was because the press got a hold of a letter from John Paul II to Cardinal Law saying, move an abuser around. And the press threatened uh, to reveal this letter to the public if Cardinal Law didn't resign. Cardinal Law resigned to protect John Paul II, and Cardinal Law was allowed to be in residence at Santa Maria Maggiore, where the crib of Christ is kept, the relic of the crib of Christ, for the rest of his life. He was given like immunity for protecting John Paul II. And that adds to the fact that John Paul II was a real operator, a real mafiosa kind of criminal and stuff like this. And if you're if you're protecting perverts, hmm, what would you expect in a case like of Emanuele Orlandi, that he would have protected the perp, whether the perp was himself or someone else? So um, these people are despicable. They're not saints. And to make someone like that a saint is to mock God to the face. Now we're going to get into the Mount Cashel Orphanage. Is this still in the United States? Uh, uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, I think so. Yes. Let me make sure. And you're now you're now on page. I am on page two eighty seven. Mine is going to, uh, I'm on page four hundred. Perpetrators of the abuse, the Christian brothers, both priests and the superintendent of the orphanage commission, committed abusive acts on many students. In the Royal Commission report, Justice Hughes said that offensive acts caused by cruelty and lust tended to corrupt their childhood and destroy its happiness. Some of the acts committed by the Christian brothers included forced mutual fellatio, buggery, forced mutual masturbation, fondling of the students' uh, privates, inappropriate, inappropriate kissing, um, insertion yeah. into, the, into the rear end. Yeah, you can't even name the things. Okay, so this is a case in Canada. Okay. Okay, then. But then it goes in about excessive corporal punishment. You you wanted to say something about that? Yeah. So what what obviously corporal punishment in itself, there's nothing wrong. A lot of parents use it, but in this case. Um, Students as young as five years old were sadistically beaten for arbitrary violations and minor offenses, beaten on the back and on the buttocks, uh, blistering of their hands, arms, bruises on, on their backside, done with furious anger. Okay, so um, sodomites are extremely violent, and they're especially violent against those who don't apply, <laughs> comply with them sexually. And... Um, this is why, you know, before, before I think, I'm trying to think now, I don't think before the Council of Trent, any religious order uh, raised boys. And then actually in Tuchman's Mirror of the 13th century, she points out there were many complaints about an absolute increase in clerical corruption after the Black Death struck and killed all the men who were vocations in the monasteries. Monasteries started taking boys in and all kinds of abuses began. We can only imagine from reading this what that was. So, um, but the Christian brothers have done a lot of good things, but in, uh, in many parts of the world, but that doesn't mean in some cases a certain criminal spirit took out. So uh, this, this is just uh, unbelievable. Uh, things you had to read are like X-rated. Uh, that you would do this to boys. If you do this to men, you should be locked up for life. But you do this to boys wearing a habit, you should be burned alive. Uh, because um, you have to have a completely twisted mind to think that your that your desire for pressure allows you to completely violate the human integrity and innocence of so many young men. I'm going to page 290. Um on the Scotland. Mine's 404. In Scotland, among the plethora of cases that shocked the most ardent, a brilliant crusade by Mary and Scott of the Sand Sunday, Sunday Mail and a three-year police inquiry exposed abuse at one of the schools run by the De La Salle brothers. 
Subsequent evidence made it clear that the abuse at St. Ninian School at Gartmore in Stirlingshire was typical of schools run by the order in many countries. What occurred at St. Ninian's took place between the late 1950s and 1982. In Australia, the De La Selle brothers were involved in similar activities as far back as 1911. In St. Ninus, the monks varied the regular beatings, rapes, the gamut of sexual abuses of boys with their own versions of, of torture and br brutality. An electric generator was set up in the boot room where boys were forced to hold onto the bare wires leading from the machine and receives a series of electric shocks. The children were also subjected to whippings with a riding crop with the ends tied to cause greater pain. Christopher Ferns, a social worker, recalled, I was beaten with the writing crop two or three times a week for four years. They told us they'd whip the devil out of us. I was battered so many times on my hand and ears that I could not hear a thing on my left side, and I've undergone extensive surgery because of it. To date, just three people have been brought to trial and all were found guilty. Among the 10 charges that were proved against Brother Benedict was assault, forcing children to eat their own. Um, puke. And breaking a boy's arm. The three men were given token sentences of two years imprisonment. Brother Benjamin appealed and was granted bail. More than a year later, his appeal has yet to be heard, and he walks freely among his fellow citizens. Jimmy Boyle, formerly the most feared man in Scotland, recalled his years in another De La Salle school, St. John's, in Springboard. Even today, I can he still hear the sounds of breaking bones as the monk deliberately smashed the child's leg to smithereens or footsteps in the night that herald yet another horrific rape of a terrified ch crying child. So it's obviously these brothers were demons and uh, should be burnt a lot, crucified and then burnt alive. And um, the point of reading these cases is this, is that under the papacy of John Paul II, almost nothing was done against these uh, clergy with almost no penalties. But Cardinal Ratzinger was fighting for increasing the penalties, but John Paul II was stopping him at every can. Can a man be claimed by anyone to be holy according to the teachings of Christ who who can't who could read what these cases without getting sick or 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 beginning to cry? They're so horrible. But to tolerate them is complicity after the fact. And indeed, you must have some kind of deep, sick, twisted affection that you get off at reading cases like this. And um, I know the public image of John Paul II is quite a different, but you can't canonize someone because he didn't do anything about a problem. That doesn't make him a saint. And um, Ed Ratzinger was telling him about these cases, and he, he did little, precious little about these things. Of course, these are civil cases. We don't know what the canonical is yet. Yallop goes on and on, talks about many cases of which he has knowledge of. We could go on for hours reading this chapter. Yes. I, I, would, I would say, AJ, at this point, let's stop because it's it's just getting so sickening. Yeah. But uh, there is a problem. It is beyond belief that's going on in this. Now, I wanted you to bring to the attention of the public your research about this Irish singer that died, since you're the one that actually tracked down this information. So... Uh, do you have that at your fingertips? Yeah. When she was sent back to Dublin for petty theft in Virginia of little things from gas stations, she was sent to the workhouse or orphanage ran by the nuns there. And uh, those nuns were the Sisters of Mercy. Uh, but mercy wasn't what they were practicing, was it? No. And what did they do to the, what is known about what they have done to their female students? 
yeah, they were. Um, they did the same thing as the yeah, the brothers and monks did in Scotland. They to boys. Them. Yeah, but this is the girls. And they tortured, the raped. Boys, they tortured, raped. And you probably like, how do women rape? Yeah, let's not even get into it. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so um, so this yeah. this this girl goes on to become a famous singer. She was in this institution, and she was a victim of this. Yeah. What's her What's her name? What's this? Uh... Sunid O'Connor. Yeah, and uh, she in 1994 96 she did what? She it, people called it a stunt, but I when we started. When we started doing this research, I said, AJ, you got to look into this case. There's something more about it. Because what was the stunt she did? She said, you got to look for the evil. And she tore up the photo of John Paul II. Yeah. And, yeah, she um, said, this is the real evil in the world. Okay. Because she knew that this was done. The Vatican knew about it. And the Vatican didn't do anything about it. And um, uh, this is why... This book is called The Inside the Dark Heart of John Paul II's Vatican, because you have to have a very dark heart not to have any sympathy for girls and boys suffering this sort of thing. And uh, just a few days after our first show on on um, corruption in the Vatican, she committed suicide, they say. Yeah. Mm, I don't know if she saw our show or if it brought back, back memories, but um, this is... Uh, the consequences of the tragedy of this allowing this kind of thing uh, to be opposed to the death penalty, like John Paul II was, to be opposed to punishing these people, to be opposed to kicking them out of the priesthood. This is enabling. This is rewarding. This is allowing the system to go on. This is approval. And this shows a complete lack of any sense of what Christianity means what the dignity of Christ is, and what the responsibility of the church is for all faithful, but especially children. And, uh, you know, John Paul II read the Gospels many times where it says, where Christ said, better that a man have a millstone tied around his neck and cast in a sea that he, than he scandalize one of these little ones. So um, if you think this guy's in heaven, now I think he has a millstone around his neck and he's in the pit of hell because... I can't see how Christ could forgive that kind of um, habitual ignoring of such a horrendous pr problem and enabling it. And um, uh, probably, I'm not saying all the bishops in the world, since they have to oh, ca view cases like this, could be have committed crimes of this sort. It's been going on a long time and it hasn't been dealt with the right way. And that's probably why the church is in such a pitiful, a totally pitiful state about it. And uh, but one thing about it is true. All these it, it doesn't mean they're all um, doesn't mean all the clergy are corrupt or all the clergy are involved. The lower level clergy, most of them don't know what's going on because of the system of secrecy. And uh, AJ, you want to make some final comments? Yeah, when I heard on Twitter that she passed right after our show and we looked into it and I was like was it really suicide or was someone uh, cleaning up something yeah when you put together the fact that the Vatican has mafia in around it and collaborates closely with them uh, when famous people spill information uh, there might be deviate, more devious people told to get rid of them so um, we don't have any evidence of that, but it was disturbing to hear of her suicide. And um, and uh, uh, it's a tragedy. It's this, it's a tragedy is, is these victims. Does this mean that the church or the priesthood has to be changed or dismantled? The priest should be allowed to marry? No, <laughs> it means that you need to punish the guilty. This is the one thing that no one talks about because the pro-gay movement wants gay marriage and end of priestly celibacy. The gays and the priesthood want to end, end these things, too, so they could commit more of these crimes. No one actually wants to put these people to death because if they were put to death, 
then pretty much the lady would start saying, hey, we should in civil law put these people to death too, even if they're not Catholic priests. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, left-wing sodomitic agenda doesn't want to tolerate that. And that's the position we need to take. And if you think because a man is a priest, he shouldn't be burned alive, having committed crimes like this, you are part of the problem. Mm -hmm. You have a sense of what it means to be Catholic. And you make the church bad. Yeah. Yep. So, um, uh, Nick shows we're ready to do is on uh, the life of John Paul II, the real, the real actual life that no papal biographer has ever told. Or we are ready to cover the murder of John Paul the first. Okay, so I highly recommend you get these two books, The Power and the Glory Inside the Dark Heart of John Paul's Vatican by David Yala, and uh, In God's Name, Investigation to the Murder of John Paul I, both by David Yala, and they're still in print in English. You can get them uh, within days, I did, and I even got the English editions in Italy, <laughs> I actually had them ordered by them from the United Kingdom because they don't allow this one to be sold in Italy at all. In Italian, the Italian edition isn't even tolerated. That's how much power the Vatican has. But the main book publisher in Italy is, is a P2 Lodge and John Paul II worked closely with them. So um, not to lose your faith, not to scandalize you, but to incite you to action and to incite you to become intolerant for this kind of corruption and uh, encourage you, I would encourage you always to take such actions as cause children who have been abused to come forward because the more these creeps get out of the church, the better the church will be. And um, it doesn't, don't worry about how many millions or billions the church will have to pay out in settlements. That's worth it if we get rid of even one pedophile because this crime is just so horrific that it shouldn't be tolerated in any way. And if you have any possibility in your country, get getting the death penalty in law for priests who do these things, nuns and religious, we should have, we should insist and we should lobby all nations that there be death penalty for this. Because if the church is going to clean it up, we lady need to clean it up in the state. And, um, you know, if they have to haul off 5,000 priests a year and burn them alive, I am not going to shed a drop of eye as long as they're really guilty. Okay. Mm. So, um, uh, we need, as laity, we need to mobilize against this crime because the only way we're going to break the, this is only a, the tip of the iceberg of the criminal network in the Catholic clergy. And if we attack on this point, which we have total support with in the civil society, we can bring down the whole corrupt organization and get the church run by holy men and women again, the way it always was. And that's uh, our duty as not as individuals who aren't members of the clergy of religious life. Uh, that's how we can clean up the church, not just saying rosaries and praying for conversions. We need to uh, be very strong advocates of the prosecution of these crimes. Yeah. So please like and share this program. Um, and yeah, we need to get that law of death penalty on the books for all these religious and priests and just clean out the filth mm -hmm. do the church with fire i would add instead of praying for the conversion of the priests it doesn't seem like let's pray for the victims of these crimes mm -hmm. uh because they're in an awful spiritual state and who prays for them yeah. the priests aren't saying masses for them and if they are will god hear their prayers until they clean up their act, I don't think God will hear their prayers, but God will hear our prayers for them. So let's remember the, these boys and girls, many of whom are now old, older people, adults in life. And when you know a friend or someone who won't even step inside of church, if you ever become a close enough associate with them, ask them if they were sexually abused or assaulted, because chances are, they or a friend were, were because people just don't turn against the church for no reason at all. And uh, if we talk about things, we might 
be able to save uh, a lot of people's souls and, and get them back to faith in Christ, even if they may never have any trust in the clergy. This is Order Military CDTV signing off. Day is full. Day is full.